Oh, I can put my hat on. Oh, there you go. Uh, well, I've just started the podcast. Dutch is going to put his hat on, and I'm. Go- well, let's look at the hat. Hello, hat. How is it? Fancy. Twenty style. I mean, you need like a zoot suit with that. Yep. And I'll pull it off and put it back on. <laughs> well, uh, we've already started the podcast, so I might as well say hello, everybody. Uh, James here, story time <laughs> with Dutch, episode forty, whatever it is. I can't remember. We've done so many now. Uh, first things first is want to apologise with the audio. We've had a ton of audio issues, uh, so we're just going off phone audio. If you're just wondering why it's not quite as good quality as usual. Next thing is we've got books somewhere. I can't think of what we did with the books, but I've got two, Owen Hart and The Rock. You can find them on Amazon, links under the, in the description of every podcast and every video. Dutch has got two books as well, The World According to Dutch and Tales from a Dirt Road. You can buy them on Amazon, or if you want them signed, you go to Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com, and you make your request there. And we've also got a T-shirt, which I've also lost. Uh, you people mean nothing to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was really unprepared. Like the audio's not working. Oh, by the way, I've got a, I've got a cigar that I bought on uh, my holidays in um, Antigua or wherever, and it's I've just found out it's cherry flavored, and it stinks. Oh, you don't like that? It's weird, and also the bits keep coming off in my mouth. But it's I like cherry flavored. <laughs> I don't like when they taste like tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. You're the worst smoker in the world. You know that. I am because, see, I don't. I've never smoked cigarettes and cigars. Well, I, nobody. I don't think you inhale them anyway. I don't think. But and if I do a cigar, I just puff on it and then blow the smoke out. Mm. I've never inhaled. I, I've done it one time, and that's like when I was like fifteen. Are you like Bill Clinton? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you I never inhaled. I never inhaled. So <laughs> now marijuana, that's a different story. I did do that. And, but I didn't do that. I didn't do marijuana till I was, oh, I was in my 20s before I see. I came from a, a town so far back in the hills. Hell, it took 10 years for marijuana to even get there. <laughs> but I had heard about it. But it, yeah, I was, I was, Already in the army when I when I did marijuana, I never did it in high school, never did it in college. Then I went in the army, and then I did it there. Was it the good stuff? Then, was it was the good like, stuff in on, foreign? Try it. And I, the, the guys would say, "Come on, try it, try it. You'll like it." And I said, "I don't know. I don't smoke, man. Boy, you don't have to smoke a cigarette." So that's what I'm talking about. I did. I've never inhaled. So the first puff was, of course, you know, I go. <laughs> And then later on, I, I learned how to do it. It's like anything in life. I, I, I like the feeling it gave me. And, but I was never really, you know, you, you see some of these these heads around here, uh, not so much now, but they want it all the time. I, and, and I'm not like that. I've never been that way about anything. Like if drinking. Now, I've gotten drunk, thrown up. That was... That stopped me from drinking because it made me sick. But anyway, uh, let's start. To, let's talk some wrestling. Uh, well, before we talk some wrestling, uh, you wanted to make mention of something real world issues that have uh, affected you in the last couple of days. Well, I'm reading the news on my phone, and then it says a shooting in Nashville. In Nashville, I lived there for about I don't know close to thirty years, and I know. And I think everybody, especially in the United States, probably the world, they know of the church. It was a church, a Christian school shooting. And when I read that, it it, it broke my heart. It really did. Like three nine-year-old kids got killed by this shooter. And it's just a problem that I don't know how we solve it. We really don't. And they said, well, you gotta you gotta outlaw the guns. Well, that's not gonna happen. Because in the United States to outlaw guns, uh, you're dealing with a constitutional issue. And even if you try to overrule the constitution, that's like at least a five, six, or seven year legal fight. So I don't know, I don't know what we're gonna do. I, I, I really don't. But my heart and condolences are out to those families and the, and the people who were involved in Nashville, 
who were involved in this shooting and but it seems like every day you pick the you you pick the paper up or you hear on the news or whatever that these I don't pull my hat off talk like this. You know, you hear about it and it makes you sad. It's almost to the point I don't even hardly listen to the news anymore. So I don't really know what's going on. And a lot of times I don't want to know. And then if I didn't know, I wish I didn't know. So mm. I'm I'm between a rock and a hard place. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Condolences to the families in Nashville and the victims who were involved in this in this shooting. Six people got shot and killed. Absolutely. Uh, we could, to be honest, we could do an entire podcast on talking about that, really. But we're going to go to far more frivolous matters of professional wrestling now. And from the most important kind of news to the least important kind of news that I've read, where it's just a big pile of nothing, but seems to have got a lot of play because CM Punk is involved. So, CM Punk made an Instagram post shooting on Dave Meltzer and John Moxley, seemingly responding to a post Dave Meltzer made on the Wrestling Observer board. And this isn't going to be the first time Dave Meltzer comes up today. So this is what Meltzer said on the board. Do you know why they didn't advertise Punk versus Moxley longer and why it had a short build? Because Punk agreed to it. Then AEW got a legal letter saying he wasn't down with it and wasn't doing it and they didn't know if he'd come with until Tony put his foot down. There are a lot of nice things you can say about him and you can absolutely argue his position on Moxley was correct, but you can't argue he willingly did what he was asked to do in the scenario, he being Punk. Then Punk responded on his Instagram stories before it being quickly deleted. Sigh, I wasn't clear to come back to wrestle yet. Their uh, then plan... Um, this is a quote, so it's a bit written badly. Then plan was to wrestle at the pay-per-view. I sat and listened to Moxley's Rocky 3 idea. I explained how I'd never seen a Rocky movie, which is a problem in itself, and thought the idea sucked. But if the boss <laughs> wanted to do it, whatever, he said he wouldn't lose to me. I'd never experienced someone refusing to lose to me. I just laughed. I asked Tony if this was what he wanted. He said, yes, he's the boss. So I said, okay, but I'd need to be cleared first. They kept saying it could just be a squash match, so I didn't need to be cleared. I scoffed at that. My health is more important. Dave Meltzer is a liar, Jericho is a liar, and a stooge. There were plans, but plans always change, but I'll never put a company above my health ever again. So there seems to be two things there that were taken out of it. One, that Moxley refused to lose to him, and two, that Tony Khan claimed that he didn't need to be medically cleared to do a squash match. Well, now that you've read this, I, I think we talked about this before, but this whole thing has gotten out of hand. I mean, the behind the things happenings in AEW is taking precedent over what they're doing in the ring. But you don't draw any money with that. I mean, it, it gets people talking about you, but it doesn't sell tickets. It doesn't sell merchandise. It doesn't do anything but kind of paint your company in a bad light. Tony is allowing things to happen because you cannot let the inmates, that's an old saying, you can't let the inmates run the asylum. That's an old saying in wrestling, and I heard it the first year I got in. But but now it's like if, if Tony is asking Punk, will you do this? Will you? Now he's paying him. So if I'm paying somebody and I'm the boss, I want you to do this, and we can talk about how it's done, but this has to be the end result. Of course guys don't want to lose. That's – that that's a natural understanding of of human uh, thinking, but Tony is letting these guys run around, and and about uh, CM Punk saying he's never seen a Rocky movie. Please, I mean he's not that much of a hermit, <laughs> and he's had to have at least heard about it, and he had to know it was at least an under. Uh, underdog story. It's about a guy coming from nowhere and becoming the heavyweight champion of the world. But I don't know. And and see what and I was, I think I said this last time we talked about this. I'm sure there were some lawyers involved because you said AEW got a legal letter from Punk's attorney saying he he's not cleared to wrestle or he's he's not going to wrestle. Mm -hmm. And even though but Punk said I'm going to show up. The legal letter said, no, he's not. That's why they didn't know whether he was going to show up on the day of the taping or not. And that's a bad situation. That's a bad situation to put any booker in. Especially, yeah. And Tony, he found himself in that situation. And Mox said he wouldn't lose to him. Wait a minute. 
that's the whole nature of the business is I help you and you help me. And we tell the story in, in a way that the fans will enjoy. I don't get it. I, I don't get it. These guys, they act like they act like they're first year wrestlers sometimes. <laughs> and I mean, Tony Khan p- pays a lot of money for that company a lot. So for some talent, some top talent to say, well, I'm not doing that because I don't want to. Well, Tony needs to, he needs to, I don't know if we'll see CM Punk back in AEW. If we don't, to me, it's no great loss. I think he hurts right now at this point more than he helps. But, but yet the people, they're still watching. I mean, not in great numbers. They're still under a million viewers a week, which is not bad, but it's not what it should be. And on Rampage, I think it's in the five hundred to six hundred thousand range. Lower, lower. But it is it. But at least on Rampage, they do have a little bit of a a reason because they're on at ten o'clock Eastern on you know like in, on the East Coast, and that's a bad time zone. And and what hurts it now? Of course, you had you got all the basketball playoffs and all this, and that's that's going to hurt your viewing. But but in but now that you can go on YouTube and look at even just I want to see this match. You type this match in in the in your Google search bar. I guess I got to use Google, and the match will come up. So I don't know. It's a mess. I can't explain it. They can't explain it. CM Punk can't explain it, explain it other from his from his uh, prerogative and, and or his side, and I don't blame him. I don't think Mox Moxley can explain it, so it's unexplainable. I guess I don't know. Let's um let's go back to I'm going to read you one more thing actually after this, but uh, before we do, I want to go to very specifically Tony Khan. This is CM Punk accusing Tony Khan of saying that he doesn't need to be cleared for a match if it's a squash match or a short match. <laughs> Is does that strike you as likely that Tony would have said that? Well, maybe he could have said it. He said, "Listen, you're not going to be in there long enough to get hurt." You know what that tells me? That leaves the door wide open for a huge, huge lawsuit. Mm-hmm. You're going to go in there, and and you have Tony Khan saying. I'm acknowledging that you're hurt, but I'm guaranteeing you, you won't get hurt. If that's me, I go in there. And what if I get hurt? And what if I don't get hurt, but I say I'm hurt, still a lawsuit. You're going to lose both ways. I don't, I don't get it. I mean, if a promoter told me and I was having problems, I love him. Oh, you won't be hurt. In, in this match, oh, I'd <laughs> step in the ring and go down. Oh, my God. Oh, they'd have to cart me out. And, and then next couple of days, they get they get a, a suit from me saying that I'm hurt. Hey, we know that CM Punk is not litigious in the, in the least. No, he's not. <laughs> he, won't, he won't sue him. Didn't he sue, uh, what's his name from Colt Ring Cabana. of Honor? Yeah, he, he sued his own friend or ex-friend. Or his but friend they, sued him they, and then these accounts. Yeah, but they got sued together one time by a doctor yep. in WWE. They got sued together. I don't get that. I mean, everybody's suing everybody else. Uh, <clears throat> I don't get it. Yep. I don't know. I want to bring up one more thing. Uh, John Moxley's response, I mean, they, they plugged this on um, Rene Paquette's podcast, his wife, mm-hmm. and there's like, oh, John Moxley's going to talk about this whole situation. Then he went on the podcast and said nothing, except for one <laughs> little thing that was actually sort of interesting, is uh, that John Moxley said that the entire summer... I was not under contract. No contract. Free agent. I could have walked into SummerSlam in 2022 that night with the AW belt if I had been so inclined. Now, that's another issue with Tony Khan entrusting wrestlers with their, you know, the biggest prize in the in the in, uh, in their promotion without a contract. That seems a bit crazy to me. Well, it is crazy, 
And I don't see Moxley walking into the SummerSlam with the a AEW title. First of all, WWE legal would have been all over that, mm. saying no. He's not walking in to any pay-per-view of ours with another belt. First of all, because that's that is already lawsuit material. Mm. Now he can walk on there, but we're not going to mention he's with AEW or anything else. Because Vince McMahon for years refused to acknowledge another wrestling promotion even existed. He never admitted till the very end that WCW uh, was an actual wrestling company in competition with, with his company. He never mentioned it. But I don't think Mox would have walked on. I don't think. Was this when uh, when all this happened? Was this when uh, Triple H was in charge of WWE Creative? Just about, yeah. Vince had just left, I think, about a month before SummerSlam. So this would have been a, a Triple H-led uh, WWE. No. And let's put it another way. He could have walked on there, but he's not going to walk on there if he's on the losing side of a match or anything. And there and WWE certainly is not going to let Moxley win over one of their guys. And I think Moxley, he just threw that out there as a maybe I could have. But I don't I, there's there's one chance in a hundred million that happening. And now that's blown out the window. That that whole scenario just just discount it because it's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, also, there is precedence with taking another title on a different promotion. When Ric Flair did it with the World Heavyweight Title in 1991, he went from WCW to the WWF, and then Jim Hurd and WCW and the NWA sued, and they couldn't show the title anymore after a few weeks. But anyway, there's already precedent on that anyway, so there's no way you could do it. And uh, we're going to move on again, and I've just realised to put this in the script as well, and I thought we'd best make mention of it. It's a couple of weeks ago now, but uh, I wanted to bring up uh, our, what well, mine especially, and you give yours, uh, Arn Anderson's son, uh, Barrett Anderson, died. So our condolences to Arn on that. Yeah. Arn's a good guy. I've known him for for years and years and years. Always a straight shooter. And... Great, great in-ring talent. Good guy. And I can speak from losing a family member myself. It really, really hurts. And my condolences to Arn and his wife and his family and all of Barrett's friends. And do we know what was what happened to Barrett? Do we know? Or did they no, release them? No, we don't. Uh, I'll give you the tweet that Arn sent out on March 11th. Last night, my family suffered a loss that should never be felt by any parents. Our older son, Barrett, passed away. I'm struggling to write this. Tell those you love that you love them. Barrett was just 37. I, I expect that you probably never met Barrett. I don't know if you ever met uh, his uh, Arn's wrestling son, Brock. No, I've never met any, any of the kids. And the reason being, they were really... Like when I was around Arn, they were they were maybe really really small, I'm sure. So, and Arn wasn't the type that mixed his personal life with his wrestling wife. Now, and why I know some of the sons of some of the other wrestlers, like Jerry Jarrett and his, I mean, I mean Jerry uh, Lawler and his sons, is because they they would come around, and I would meet them, and but. Arn never brought his sons around, which I, which you didn't I, bring your kids around. I did bring my kids around as a reason. <laughs> <laughs> that was my daughter talking, but uh, I didn't know him, but and I don't know why he why he passed away, and I really don't want to know. But I thought sometimes they release that, mm. but I don't even, I don't even know what kind of guy he was. But I'm sure if Arn raised him. He was a straight shooter, just like his father. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll move on again, and we're sort of like going back and forth from like serious news stories to not so serious to serious to not so serious. And this is uh, sort of on the less serious side, comparatively give me, give me speaking. A good, 
Give me a good bullshit story. Oh, well, here we go then. Uh, uh, the word of the week is octogenarians. Uh, Ronda Rousey has brought up uh, that her feud with Liv Morgan last year was hamstrung by a bunch of octogenarians who still think they know how to be hip while putting less than five minutes of thought a week into each woman's storyline. Now, you'll probably remember from last year from watching SmackDown and a couple of a couple of matches and promos and all that kind of thing, Ronda and Liv Morgan. Do you think that's a fair criticism? There's not even any octogenarians in WWE. No. Well, first of all, that's that's ageist, a g e i s t. It's an ageist statement. First of all, Ronda Rousey needs to learn the business too. Liv Morgan needs to learn it too. And the reason I say that is because they've been exposed to one system, and that was the WWE system. Now, guys like me. I bring up my old buddy, Ric Flair. I mean, and Arn Anderson and the people we talked about that's been around be before. See, I was brought up under a lot of different systems, different bookers, different techniques, different maneuvers, different style, different reasoning, thinking. See, I was, I was broke, 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 uh, raised in the Tennessee style, the Georgia style. Uh, Miss Alabama, Mississippi, Texas style, Florida style. But Ronda Rousey was brought in under the WWE style and Liv Morgan too. So they just know that system. And the system is, you know, how you conduct yourself, how you do this, how you do. And it doesn't mean it's right. Okay, let me take you back to the to the Performance Center in Orlando, Florida. Do you know what a bill is? It's a almost like a hip toss, a throw, isn't it? It, it is a hip to, a running hip toss is what it is. But they teach it down there is you hook your hands, and I may have said this before here. Mm -hmm. They hook their hands under here, and you can't go anywhere. I mean... And it hurts like hell when they do it. And then when you land, you land on your hip and you spin. And the first time I did it, the old, uh, old veteran backed me up a corner and slapped the living crap out of me. And I didn't know what it was for. So I got in the back. And I was expecting for this veteran to just punch me. And I went back and he says, and I'm looking at him, he said, who taught you that? And I said, nobody. And nobody did teach me. I just saw it done. And I thought that was the way you did it. He said, no. When you're going to build somebody out of the corner, you put your arm all the way underneath their arm here. And so when they when they leave the speed, now you can push the guy. That's how the guy gets distance. That's how he gets height. But, but then brought up under that said, as far as the octogenarians, that's like an 80-year-old person. Well, you know, that was a that was an insult for the older people, but it also means she's knocking the people. I mean, literally criticizing them to their face, because telling them they don't know what to do when she she had basically doesn't even know what to do. See, I, I, I'm I, I'm not a big I, I'm a Ronda Rousey fan to a point, and she has one match. And that's about it. I don't think she uses any type of uh, uh, reasoning or thinking process. It's it's a bit, it's physical acting is what this is. And she come from the MMA world, the you know the shoot fighting world, and she found out you can make a lot more money in pro wrestling than you could probably make in MMA. And her claim to fame is she beat two two women back to back like champions. Then she went up against the puncher. She had a ground game. When she'd take him down, she had him. Mm -hmm. But if you don't go down, and there's Holly Holm in the first round, I think, tagged her, and she's got the glass jaw anyway. Down she went. She didn't get up. And I don't think she ever recovered from that. But anyway, for her to actively knock the people that she's working for, 
I, I think we have the inmates trying to run the asylum again, but it's not going to work in WWE, not under Triple H. Mm -hmm. He will cut that, and he won't forget it either. Now, and she's complaining that the girl's only getting three minutes. Well, three Believe minutes me, of thought, done. three minutes of thought into their storylines, or five minutes of thought, uh, to quote exactly, of uh, thought in their storylines every week. Well, can she think? Can she think? That's what I'm saying. Does she have something better? Listen, if you don't like your story, go in there and tell them why you don't like the story. And they didn't give them more time because... To me, if I'm watching a, a WWE girls match right now, I lose interest in the first in the first five minutes. That's, that's probably why they're ending it in five minutes because I lose interest in it. Now you're talking about the girls. I think AEW has a better women's roster now than WWE does, and they go back and forth, but. We'll see. I, but I don't think that's a good career move for Miss Rousey to lock the people that she works for and are booking her. I'm so she needs to she needs to temper that tongue just a little bit. You like that word temper? Yeah, I, yeah, no, it's a, a fine word to <laughs> fine words put in. I'm gonna give you a couple of other things actually. Apparently this only came yesterday. I didn't even put it in the script. Is that uh, she had pitched a sort of hardcore match with thumbtacks and such with Liv Morgan that was turned down. And I think uh, that was one of her complaints that, you know, the octogenarians don't know what's cool. And her idea was thumbtacks and hardcore stuff and basically doing what FMW or Mick Foley was. And also, uh, Vince McMahon wasn't really with the company. He was the oldest person in the company. He was 77. And a couple of weeks into Ronda Rousey and Liv Morgan, Vince McMahon left and then it was Triple H in charge. And then we was trying to think who else would even be pushing 70. Bruce Pritchard, Michael Hayes, someone like that. But that's it. Well, okay, she pitched a match about thumbtacks. Mm -hmm. Well, see, I'm not a strong believer in that hardcore stuff because at one point, hardcore took over wrestling. Listen, if it, if it was only hardcore that you needed to be a wrestler, you could walk into any bar in any town, in any city in the United States, any night of the week, and find somebody and teach them probably in 20 minutes how to have a hardcore match if they wanted to do it. It takes no talent. How much talent does it take to hit somebody with a chair? Not much. That takes talent to keep them knocking their heads off. And, it, you know, and you got to catch this chair. And see, Mick Foley used to have a thing. He said, oh, I, I never catch the chair. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you catch it on your head, buddy. And but I always hated hardcore. Mm. I always hated that. And as far as girls and females going through tax, I wouldn't want to see that myself. I don't think the little kids out there and the little girls that are watching these ladies and maybe aspiring to be them one day saying, oh, I don't know if I want to do that because there is no way to fake a attack going in your back. <laughs> I don't know how they do that. Because you, if you even looked at me with a tack and wanted to stick it in me, we'd have a fight. <laughs> nothing, nothing sharp is <laughs> going into my body. That's why I, when I get a shot of needles, oh, I can't, I, can't I, I can't take that. Like when the doctor is going to put the needle shot in, I'm going, mm. I embarrass myself. Even doctors have looked at me and said, what is wrong with you? I said, oh, nothing. It's a long story. It is a long story. But but I don't think the people want to see the hardcore matches or the blood or anything like that. Leave it to the guys uh, that know how to do this and don't mind doing it. And as far as a, a whole card, say a whole pay-per-view built on hardcore, they wear it out. I mean, it's like listening to a band that played the same type song every song. If you see it in the first match, and if the second match does it in the third, what is the main event going to do? Take a bulldozer and people in it and push them into the back? I mean, that's the only way they could top that.
But anyway, I think Ronda Rousey's way out of line, way out of turn. And yeah, they could probably come up with some more stuff, but I don't think I don't think Ronda Rousey is is advanced enough in her pro career. I'm not talking about her amateur career. I don't think she's advanced enough in her pro career to even offer an opinion, really. We're going to move on. We're going to go to WrestleMania, do some quick predictions of 39. And at this point, I've strong-armed you. I've strong-armed you, Dutch, into watching it. I'm going to watch it, and we'll do a little special on it uh, next Monday, I think, when, uh, I when we can also review it. This, we need to delete this off the show with this. Okay. So all you all you people that are listening in, and we, we've often said about this podcast, Hey, just get in the back seat and listen to us, and and you will, will learn something. And if you don't know by now, I only watch the shows that I'm required to watch. Uh, I watch Rampage on Friday night, and I do a podcast immediately following it on an opposing channel. Mm. I, I will say, but uh, <laughs> but I don't watch WrestleMania. I don't watch pay per views. I don't just don't watch it, but this time, because you bribed me, folks. James is being illegal here. He bribed me to watch it, or dared me to watch it. I said, "Okay, I'm going to watch this, and I'm going to watch night one and night two, so I know what I'm talking about." But what was the question? <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. I, I, I didn't actually have a question for you. Uh, I'm going to give you <laughs> very quickly the rundown of the card. Uh, if you've got any... Oh, oh, prediction, prediction. Yeah, prediction. So uh, we, we've mostly got night one. Uh, we pretty much mostly got night two, but some of the matches could bounce back and forth. So and um, this is off Wikipedia, so God, God knows if they've got it right or not. But first off, Austin Theory versus John Cena. It's for the title. The United States Championship. Well, Austin, Cena could put him over because Cena's made his money, and I think he likes Austin Theory. He really likes him, and he he may he may slip Theory over. Of course, he may slip him over, and they they have an afterbirth where he beats the where Cena beats the crap out of him, and you know he's still standing tall at the end. He may victory. Uh, uh, theory may get the get the win because I think Cena is the type who, and I always heard this coming into the business. When you leave, leave it in better shape than you found it. And I think Cena is a adherent of that, a proponent of that. And I think I think he will really help Austin Theory. And Theory to me is just another is just another Cena coming along a 20 years difference because theory. And when I was with TNA theory sent me uh, some promotional materials, I was going to book him then because I saw him just off. I saw a little bit of a match of his and just some eight by 10 photographs. I said this, and I could look at him and I, I thought, you know, this kid's got something. Now what he had, I didn't really know, but I wanted to find out. I wanted to bring him in and put him in a couple of matches just to, you know, analyze him and look at what he's got to offer and, and push him a little bit. Because I think uh, he's – I think he is the second coming of John Cena. And he's a good interview. And you feel like slapping him automatically. That's the first thing you look at in a guy. Does he have chemistry with viewers? And when he has the chemistry, it's easy to do something with people. And a slappable face always helps. <laughs> that maybe, does maybe not in podcasting though. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we've got another twelve matches, so we're just going to have to speed through these. Uh, Seth Rollins versus Logan Paul. Keep in mind that Logan Paul's contract runs out after WrestleMania. Hmm. No, I, I think that Rollins will beat him. Okay. Do. Trish, uh, because Strat there's no purpose. There's no purpose in putting Logan Paul over. Exactly. Trish Stratus, so, Lita, Becky Lynch. Trish Stratus, Lita, Becky Lynch versus Damage Control. Uh, Bailey, Dakota Sky, and EO Sky. I, the legends, probably. Yep. Go with them. Yeah. This is a big show. You, you try to leave them happy. Yeah. Brock Lesnar versus Omos. Uh, I think Lesnar beats him. Yeah. Bianca Belair versus Oscar. 
I, I think this is a uh, very early in the run of Bianca. I think she 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 she's over. Mm-hmm. I, I forgot to mention that was for the uh, Raw Women's Championship as well. Uh, Charlotte Flair versus Rhea Ripley uh, for the SmackDown Women's gonna, Championship. I think they're going to swap this one. Mm-hmm. And the reason being is because that Rhea Ripley, she has a lot of the it factor. Mm-hmm. I think Charlotte is kind of old hat now. She's been around for 14 years, 15 years. So I think Rhea Ripley needs to needs to run with that a while. I'm a I'm a big fan of hers. So is it just the it factor for Rhea, or what else about Rhea? Now she has a lot of upside, but I don't think it has been explored. Now she's with Dominic right now, mm-hmm. but that can run concurrent with each other for a while. But I think she needs to. I mean, who else is Charlotte going to go against? I, I, see, that's what, oh, what that's what's wrong with the women. The women really now their bench is weak. I bet for weeks and weeks and weeks about the SmackDown bench being empty with guys. Now it's not empty, but now the the females are empty. So, so let's swap it up and let's see what it does. And if people said, oh, that's the wrong thing to do. Well, if you're going to stay the course, you're going to be in the same boat next week as you're in right now. So change it up, change the whole landscape of it, and see what you got. Because then when you change it up, now you, you're thinking differently about everything. And everything looks different. We will go to, this is probably going to be the night two a card. One or two matches might go tonight. one. But anyway, Gunther versus Sheamus versus Drew McIntyre. Triple threat match for the Intercontinental Championship. I think Gunther goes over here. He pins somebody. He may even pin both of them. Because Gunther is a project that they don't really know what they had till they saw him. Now the people see that he is uh, he's legit. And they have a whole, whole lot of time and space for Gunther to cover. And this is the wrong time to beat him because he has a little bit of steam going into this match. So let him keep it. Mm -hmm. So I think Gunther over. Edge versus the demon, Finn Balor. I think Balor goes over. I, I haven't followed them this close, but I think Balor is now picking up steam. So instead of taking that steam off him, uh, and I don't know how they're going to do this, of course, but I think we get Balor's hand raised. Well, it's Hell in a Cell as well, I've just read as well. So Finn Balor to win there. Uh, this next one, uh, I haven't got my glasses, and it's quite far down on the screen. Bear with me. Liv Morgan and Raquel Rodriguez versus Natalia and Shotzi versus Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler versus Chelsea Green and Sonya Deville. Ronda Rousey's got currently a broken forearm. Of all the matches, that is the least one I'm interested in because it's a fourteen. What is it? A fourteen for? It's not even for a championship. It's just a WrestleMania yeah. showcase, which I think is their way of saying uh, we didn't have anything better for any of these women. <laughs> that's what it's uh, actually. That's what it's saying. It said, mm. well, just to get them on the card, and that probably be one of the shorter matches of the night. So maybe Ronda Rousey can break out her encyclopedia of wrestling knowledge and come up with a great finish for it. <laughs> and I don't, the- I don't, I don't, I don't expect. I expect it to be okay. I don't expect it to be, you know, because nobody has any steam in this match. Nobody. So I think the match will be okay. I don't think it'll be outstanding. Well, now they could surprise me, and it could be a great match. Speaking of which, here's the men's WrestleMania showcase, but in brackets, uh, we didn't have anything better for these people to do match. Braun Strowman and Ricochet versus the Street Profits versus Alpha Academy versus the Viking Raiders. Well, that's another match, maybe one notch higher than the ladies in anticipation. But I don't know. That's another. It it is what it is. It's it's just a match. Pick a name I call those matches. I, I call those matches 
concession matches. <laughs> I told a guy one time, I said, man, I said, the promoters are dying to have you on their cards. And he went, really? I said, oh, yeah. He, he said, why? He said, because of my last match? Yeah, I said, exactly. Why did they like it? He, they said, no. What they liked was they sold more Cokes and more popcorn doing your match than they did during intermission. So your match is actually like a second intermission. <laughs> so they love you, love to have you on the card. <laughs> and he thought I was serious. He said, really? I said, I'm kidding you. Relax. But he was only been in the business like a year or so. But I laughed. I didn't mean to be mean to him, but I was just kidding him. But he thought I was serious. Incredible. You get all sorts in wrestling, don't you? Just people who just do not get sarcasm whatsoever, apparently. It's one, one of the they types get you get. <laughs> We've got two more matches. Oh, th sorry, three. Uh, the Usos versus Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. It's got to be Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, hasn't it? Got to be. Because this big show, they've worked this 10-month-long angle, not necessarily with Kevin Owens, but he became attached to it about two months ago somehow, with Zayn and so I think, I think the Usos will lose. We have new tag team champions, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll go from there. Roman Reigns versus Cody. There is one more match, but I'm going to save that for the end. But Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes, I think that one's written in the stars as well, is it not? Yeah, I think it is because I think uh, – and we have heard that Roman wants to take time off. I don't blame him because now when he takes time off, it's not time that he's away. It's time to where he's not on that TV every week. He's not overseeing his welcome. He takes time away. And what's that old saying? Absence makes the heart grow fonder. How can we miss you so, if you don't go away? <laughs> right. And I, I, I think it's a, uh, and they put so much effort and so much time into Cody. And I think Cody actually, I hate to say this, but his shoulder injury actually worked for his benefit. Yeah, a pectoral tear, uh, very specifically. Well, it, it worked, and he had he had three wins over Seth Rollins before he got hurt, So, and it looked awful. It looked terrible. Mm. I mean, so, but, and I, and I think they have, like you said, written in the stars. Yeah, I think the tag team title switches and the heavyweight title switches. Mm. And I saved this for last because I thought you might be able to talk about it a little bit more, is Rey Mysterio versus Dominic Mysterio. First, uh, who do you think is going to win? And secondly, talk to me about Dominic a bit because you've been watching SmackDown. He's been on there uh, periodically. And what do you think of his performance and his uh, evolution this last year? Oh, I loved it because he started with his dad. Then he got a little rambunctious. And him and his dad started having problems and and anybody and this is family oriented. This is why everybody can relate to this story, especially if you have a teenage son or daughter. They want to start leading their own life. And he went against his father. And they told this story perfect. Because they took their time. Even even I was saying. I was warning. I was warning Ray to. I was saying, punch him, hit him, because that's what everybody wanted. And he took it, and he took it, and he took it, and up to the point uh, to where Ray could take it if it was directed at him. But when it was directed at his wife and his daughter, that's when he put his foot down. And so I think in this, I think Ray, I think Ray will win this. Then they will come back with some afterbirth and an aftermath to it and continue to tell the story. So even Rhea Ripley could get in on it. And then I don't know, but I think that's a finish that Ray wins it. But he may want to just put his son on. He may, he may want to do that. So I can't – if 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 Ray was not leaving, and I don't think he's leaving, because I think, why would you leave when you're red hot? Don't leave now. 
because there's more to this story to be told. So I think Ray wins, and then they, they got an afterbirth to it because I love the story, and I wouldn't mind for it to continue. Now, you, oh, you just caught me while I was typing something there. Uh, now, I'm going to disagree with you there. I think Dominic wins it, continues the story, that kind of thing. You know, Ray's going to beat him. I don't think I don't think it's going to be a thing where, like, he's worried about beating his son too much. I think someone's going to interfere and Dominic will win. But uh, Ray also gave an interview very recently where he said he's not ready to retire yet. He'll be ready to retire at the age of 50 around there, and he's currently 48. So he's probably going to be sticking around, hopefully, for another couple of years. Well, see, I didn't even hear that interview. I didn't think he was going to be leaving anyway. But I do. I don't know. They, they This is the type of match. It's a booker's dream. You can go either way with this match and still work something at the end that Dominic's going to walk away with some heat, or Dominic and – Rhea Ripley are going to walk away with more heat. That's why I'm saying he could lose and they could they could walk away. So anyway, that I would be watching this match because I'm really really interested in what kind of finish they're going to do with it. Yeah, I'm impressed with uh, Dominic as well because he went from within six months he went from basically a taller version of Ray. So if, I'm sure people have seen Ray with his mask off. He just looks like a child. He just looks like a six foot tall child, and somehow he's taken that into a real little rat persona with a lot I mean that mullet he's got going is heat no you're talking about Ray no uh, Dominic oh, he's okay. got you know how he went from basically Ray's son to little baby face kid to one of the most important characters on the show oh he's a great heel because he's a smart ass kid he's a smart ass kid who doesn't know nothing but thinks he knows everything and that's the image that the, the fans get of him. They hate him, yet they want it. They want to like him, but they still gotta hate him. <laughs> Not hate in a, a bad term, but they they just don't like the character. And him and Rhea Ripley, I think, match up. And that's just one of those things that just like it's in front of you. And the bookers looked at it, or the guys who were creative looked at that and said, why don't we put those two together? Because they kind of match. And and they have, and I think they got a they got a ton of potential between them, even as singles or as partners. Hmm. I really like that. We are going to now get to the meat of the podcast. We're going to be talking about the WWE Hall of Fame. As we record this on a Wednesday, a couple of days before this is released, there are four names announced. Now, at some point, there was a rumor going around that there was going to be a referee inducted at one point, but now we're not so sure. And also, we believe there's going to be a recipient of the Warrior Award, which is also unannounced to this time, so we can't talk about it. Uh, the Warrior Award was at first a PR exercise, uh, but now recognizes longtime WWE employees behind the scenes as Ultimate Warrior, who pitched the Warrior Award, named after himself, of course, uh, originally intended to honor backstage WWE personnel who otherwise doesn't get an honor. So what's the question? Oh, there wasn't a question. I just thought you were pen pensive there to say something. <laughs> <I'll>... No, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking, what was the... Uh... I think a referee is a is is a good is a good category. Yeah. It'd be Earl Hebner, surely. I can't imagine it would be have anyone to be, else. It'd have to be a Hebner. Well, it'd only be one now, Earl. Because Dave passed away, what, three months ago, four months ago? Mm, a bit a bit later, six, seven, something like that, probably. Okay. It'd have to be Earl because people know him. And for the backstage that could be an announcer. Who was the guy that died within the last year? Howard. Finkel? I think he died a few Finkel. years ago, Finkel. Maybe. Hey, when I say a month, it could be three years. So just make allowances for me. Okay? Dave Hebner How, died nearly Finkel. a year ago in May. Oh, sorry. No, June. Sorry. God, how time flies. See? But I said he died within the last year, and you said three years. No, that was so Howard. You, no, that was Howard Finkel. No, Dave Hebner. You said a few months, yeah. and I said six months. It turns out it was ten. Uh, Howard Finkel. He died in twenty twenty April. Okay, you're right. 
But, but yeah, I, I see nothing wrong with that. If it doesn't take too much time, because not a lot of people want to hear. And if it's Earl Hebner, if he gets it, his speech won't be long. He'll just thank everybody and he'll get off. Yeah. Uh, with and uh, I, I don't know about a referee, I mean, an announcer, Finkel. I don't know who would accept for him. But, no, he's, but that's he's already just, in. He's already in. Oh, he's already in. Oh, yeah. See, that's how much I know about what I'm talking about. I know <laughs> wrestling. I don't know the behind the scenes stuff. So, who would you suggest? What's it going now? Uh, the one that I always saw. Are you talking about an announcer or anyone? No, anybody. Anybody. Uh, Ivan Koloff. I think he's the biggest, uh, most glaring gap at the moment, or one of them. I'm going to suggest something. He never worked in WWE, but Ox Baker. Uh -huh. And I wish he would be there to accept the award. What an interview. And he had a he had a big mustache like this, and he'd go. I, I, when I broke in, he was there, and he would clap his hands, and he would do his interviews, and very very entertaining promo. Now his ring work wasn't that great, but you believed him because he had the heart punch, which reminds me of a story. Mm -hmm. I started in Georgia, one, and we used to run Savannah, Georgia every Friday night, which was a long trip from Atlanta. It was like 260 miles. Now, it was all interstate, but still 260 miles is still 260 miles. And the owner of the territory was named Ray Gunkel, who used to be a, you know, an active wrestler, but he had kind of stopped. And they put him on a card in Savannah against Ox. And only because Ray was down there on vacation. Like Savannah's on the it's on the ocean and you go down there and you know, vacation for three or four or five days. But they had the match, and I'm watching the match because I was riding with Ox that night. And Ox was on last, so I'm in the back and I'm standing around and I'm watching the match. Match was okay. And the bail wrong. Ray Gunkel won. We come, we come back, but he had hit him with the heart punch or something, but he didn't pin him. Something happened. So we went to the dressing rooms and right before we lay up, a referee came in the dressing room and they said, Ray Gunkel just died. What? They said, yeah, they, they're just taking him out. Yeah, he's dead. Now that's a hell of a damn leaving note and I remember that night and you know what Ox was worried about whether he was going to get fired for, kill <laughs> for killing <laughs> the fired. owner it, it, no for killing the owner <laughs> now it's not funny and I don't mean to laugh about that but that's, that's what he was kind of worried about but and that helped his Reputation because he had hit another guy with the heart punch, uh, one of the Torres brothers, mm -hmm. and killed him. So that heart punch, all of a sudden, this is when people kind of, kind of believe wrestling was only up and up. And so when he pulled out that heart punch and he got it ready, the, that crowd would come up. But interesting, we, we went 260 miles that night. And I was asking, Ox, did you hit him? I was even believing it. Did you even hit him? He said, no, no, man, I didn't touch him. <laughs> <laughs> but he still thought uh, he was going to get fired, even though he didn't touch but him. But he did, he did think he was going to get fired. He, he really did. But And that started a whole flurry of things when Ray Gunkel died. We'll, we'll, we'll start this story another time. We don't have time now. Hmm. But Ann Gunkel was Ray Gunkel's wife. And when Ray died, in come the flock of vultures. Mm -hmm. And they were going to come in because Atlanta was owned by several different people. And they come in and they were going to force her out and take and take Ray's part of it. Mm -hmm. That's why she pulled up. She pulled away from them and formed her own company, Gunkle Enterprises. Now, uh, I'm so, 
I'm uh, looking at this now. It says, after a 10-minute brawl, this is from illegalforeignobject.com, I'd heard uh, around about this, in which Gunkel again came away with victor- uh, victory uh, against Oxbaker. He died in the locker room. So he must have been hit with a heart punch, scooped out, and then he dropped in the locker room afterwards. This is suggesting. Does that sound right? I don't think he was hit with a heart punch. No, I mean, not hit with it, but I mean, I mean, he obviously took the heart punch and that's where, you know, but then he died in the locker room afterwards. But he did die in the locker room afterwards. Yes, yes. yes. But I think what people, what Ox did tell people that his heart punch sometimes had a delayed reaction. <laughs> you know, it, would get, it wouldn't get you right then, but all of a sudden you go to the dressing room and you go, whoop. No, but he, he did, did die of a heart attack. What what Ray had was high blood pressure. Uh, it's, and it was a, really a hot, hot, hot day in Savannah. He gets like 105 there sometimes. And he had been on the beach, and I'm sure that – and he'd been drinking a little bit. So, But he, he died of a heart attack. He just dropped over dead in the dressing room. Absolutely. And it says here – I'm going to have to lean in, sorry. Undiagnosed arteriosclerosis. There we go. That's, that's a word to read for the first time on air, isn't it? Well, I don't know what that is, but Heart attack. apparently, <laughs> <laughs> apparently, it took effect that night. Yeah, definitely. Uh, right, we are going to go to the Hall of Fame now, and the headline of this year, twenty twenty three, is going to be Rey Mysterio inducted by fan and friend of the show Conan. Stories mm-hmm. on Ray about... I mean, give some stories on Ray. I mean, you shared the locker room with him for a few years. What sort of set him apart from all the other luchadors and high flyers? Well, I, I don't know Ray that much, that well. And I probably... And I never I never wrestled him. I maybe may have been in matches with him, but I don't even remember that much. I don't remember Jack Swagger or, or Cesaro working with Ray that much where I was on the outside. We work mostly with uh, with Alberto Del Rio, that's who we work with. But Ray would have been a perfect, perfect opponent for us because of my immigration stance. But he would have been perfect. But uh, and I think Ray was liked because he has that Bobby Eaton syndrome about him. Nobody had anything bad to say ever about Bobby Eaton or Ray Mysterio because he was always friendly. He didn't talk about people. He didn't talk bad about people. And he was kind of a quiet guy anyway. So, and everybody liked him because, you know, he had that Switzerland stance in the dressing room. He was always neutral. So whether it's they was, say they were knocking somebody in the dressing room, he would just listen. He never would contribute. He never would add. He never would take away. He'd just listen. And he and he looked young, and he looked, you know, and he had a nice smile. And everybody loved Ray. And that's the way you wish everybody could be, but, of course, everybody's not going to be that way. <laughs> and he was little, and I think him being small – worked to his advantage, especially when he worked with really, really bigger guys, because if you, if you, I've said this before, you walk down the street and you see a fight going on, but all of a sudden this big guy is fighting this much smaller guy. You don't even know what the fight's about, but who are you going to pull for? The The little guy, Mm -hmm. because it's already stacked against him anyway. So what if he won? So you ought, you don't even know what it's about. But you're automatically, I don't know why that is, you start pulling for the underdog. And I think, Ray, that worked for him with the fans. And he had he had nice, uh, you know, attire. He uh, had great-looking mask. And he did such great stuff. And he did such good stuff that the big guys couldn't do. So even in a fan's mind, you could rationalize, well, if people wanted to go toe-to-toe, and power to power against this guy, he didn't have a chance. Therefore, he goes just skirting around the ring and dodging and all these moves that the big guy, uh, he can't do. And, and that got him over with fans. But I have never heard anybody ever say 
one word against Ray Mysterio, nor do I ever expect to. Do you know, uh, as as I uh, said, tongue in cheek, friend of the show, Conan, of anyway, figure that out uh, for long time listeners of the podcast. But Ray really owes so much of his career to Conan because originally, I believe, I've not researched this just off the top of my head. Ray was pegged because he was so short as a mini. Basically, he was going to be putting like a midgets division in Mexico, and Conan was the one who said, "This dude is far too talented for that, and he could mm-hmm. be the, you know, the Spider Man sort of like." little scrappy underdog guy who takes on the bigger guys and did and did it so well this is more of a critique on his in-ring ability uh, and his his incredible in-ring ability what sets him apart from a thousand other people who are doing high-flying moves why is ray better well that's this you've heard me talk about he's got it there's something about him charisma or it's a feeling you can't really pinpoint it. I think the mass did help him because now you can, he's got an air of Mysterio, mystery. He's got an air of mystery about him. And he, he did such good stuff. And I think that's what got him over. Mm-hmm. And who knows, like, I'm a booker and I see this little, a smaller guy, not a little guy, but a smaller guy. But he does all this good stuff. And they gave him a chance, and he started getting over. They gave, they had a little bit of patience with him, and they put him out there. And he he would be good against middle of the card heels who've got a sharp mouth that you just want to walk up and slap the hell out of. The Ray did good against those, and then they said, "Well, let's let's move him up a little bit, like Conan." I'm. I'm sure that's what he did. And he worked him up at guard, took, they took their time with him and got him to where they needed him to be. And that's, that's probably his, how he got over. I don't think they worked anything quick with Ray. I don't know his career in Mexico, but when Conan looked at him, I'm sure he saw that there's something in this guy. And you can look at somebody. If you're in a position of authority, you can kind of say where guys are going to be. You got to rely on that. You got to rely on 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 your own thinking, saying, "I think this guy can do it." You don't know for sure. Do you give him a chance? And like in basketball, the worst shot ever taken was the one that's not taken, mm-hmm. or something like that. They said, you know, I mean, take the shot and see what it does. Remember, I've said before, wrestling. If you make a mistake one week, you got 51 more weeks in that year to fix that mistake. So if something doesn't work, and that's the beauty of television. So are you are you going to ask anything about Bray Wyatt here? Because i got some comments about him. Mm, I can do at the end. I'll bring up Bray oh. Wyatt at the end. Um, oh. uh, in fact, yeah, you will have to remind me. Stacy Keebler is the next inductee. And I did a... Vi- I did a video a few months ago saying the worst top 10 or bottom 10 worst inductees ever. And if Stacy had been announced at that point, she would have taken number one. She's got to be the most box ticky, undeserved Hall of Famer <laughs> in the WWE Hall of Famer ever. Oh, I got to agree. I got to agree. This girl, she got there because she's a good looking girl. She's a cheerleader, I guess, from somewhere. And they put her out there. And she has a nice face, a nice body. Her wrestling sucks. Her promos suck. And that's giving them uh, the benefit of the doubt. And I'm saying, like, you could walk into any bar in any city in the United States any night of the week and find a guy who can do hardcore the same way with this. You could walk into, say, any college, and you could find a girl looking as well as Stacy Keebler or as good as Stacy Keebler and probably can't do a promo either and can't wrestle. And she could be in the Hall of Fame too if she just had the same, you know, push that Stacey uh, Keebler had. 
I don't know why she's in there other than people kind of know her. And she needs to walk in backwards with her <laughs> hand out like this and say, thank you very much, and leave. <laughs> That's what she, she backed into it. And I heard she's really a nice person. She's really a nice you know, individual. And it's just them giving. It's like one of the matches you described in WrestleMania. Well, we don't really have anything for you. So we'll just put it to the WrestleMania. What, what do they call that? The, a showcase it was. A showcase. Well, this is a showcase Hall of Fame induction. Mm. And, that's, and you hit it right on the head. Name one thing that she ever did that's memorable. Um, I, well, in fact, well, she dated George Clooney. That's the most memorable thing she's ever done. Uh, her qualifications, I've written them down here, include being highly sexually attractive, uh, performing as a one. valet. <laughs> she was a valet in WCW and WWF slash E. Terrible wrestler, dated George Clooney, and became a quasi-celebrity away from wrestling, appearing on Dancing with the Stars, and did a few acting, presenting gigs, and that's it. As, a, as I've said before... Dance it, Stars was a result of what? Being in WWE. No kidding. So that was just a, a good result of it. So what was your question now? I, mean, well, I, I, I was going to make the statement, see if you agree with me, is that this is, a, apart from the fact that I really cannot stand box ticking, that's like something that I really object to constantly in life, is also that they want her in because they think they may get some sort of like semi-rub from People magazine or something like that. You know, some little article somewhere saying... Stacey Keebler, who barely wrestled 20 years ago, is now a WWE Hall of Famer. Oh, yeah. They just want to get some publicity off of it, which I, I don't have a problem with, but shouldn't there be some kind of criteria to be <laughs> in any of this stuff? But see, with if you're just going to... And what is she going in for? What is it? Uh, just regular. She's not like a celebrity induction or anything. She's just, she's just a WWE legend. Well, I guess she is a legend, but it's not for what she did. She was just there, mm -hmm. basically taking up taking up air. Nice looking lady, nice looking girl, and that's about where her qualifications really end. Yeah, uh, I should also say uh, worst WWE regular Hall of Fame inductee, not including the celebrities, because I think we can agree like Kid Rock or someone's worst, but. We're going to move on to our next one. I think Kid Rock. I don't. I don't have the disdain. You like that word? I don't like. I don't have the disdain for him that you do, because I could see Kid Rock in there more than I could see who was that game show host they had in there. Drew, Drew Carey. Drew Carey. Thank you. Yeah. See, I don't. I don't know why he's in there either, but he is. But I don't know. They don't have any criteria for any of this stuff, so. We'll just take it as it is, as it comes, and we're, that's my view. It may not be everybody's view, but... Well, next one, you've got, definitely got a lot of views on this one. Andy Kaufman. Uh, he's going to be inducted, we believe, by Jerry Lawler if he's well enough. If not, hopefully Tony Clifton will do it or something like that. But uh, Andy Kaufman, I don't even need to... In fact, you know what? I'll, I'll read the bump. But after originally being turned down by Vince McMahon Sr., Bill Apter put Andy in touch with Jerry Lawler, and the rest is history. Kaufman was involved in Memphis wrestling for two years, but when he wrestled women to uh, the famous bout of Jerry Lawler that saw him uh, in a neck brace for ages afterwards, he actually wrestled about a dozen or so matches with Memphis, and he was involved in Memphis wrestling for about two years, which I think people don't really realise. I think people maybe think that Andy was only there for a few weeks or for one match oh. or something, but no, he was he was fully involved when he could be. Oh, yeah. This is my story about Andy Kaufman. I used to ride with Lawler a lot. Like, we would ride to Louisville, and we'd ride to Evansville, and on these trips, of course, you know, we would talk to each other, just like we're doing right now. But except, remember, we got two people in the back listening to us. They don't say anything, but we know they're there. But anyway, a lot of we riding up the road one day, and he says, hey, I'm, uh, do you know who Andy Kaufman is? And I said, yeah, because he had been on Saturday Night Live at that point. He was on taxi. I said, yeah, I know who he is. And I didn't know a lot about him because guess what? My viewing hours, I was working every night. 
So all this stuff, everybody, you know, I never watched one episode of Dallas ever because I was working all the time. I didn't, I, I always heard about the show, but I never watched it. So anyway, I said, he said, well, we, you have, you have seen gonna, a Rocky film though, haven't you? I have seen a Rocky film. Okay. Okay. But not when I was working. <laughs> <laughs> but, and he was going to bring him in. And uh, that Monday, I said, what are you going to do? And he said, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? He said, well, we got an idea. And I didn't learn this till we did Dark Side of the Ring last year. I mean, the tale of the territories. And we had an episode, and it was, I was on it, Jerry Lawler, Jimmy Hart, Jeff Jarrett, Jerry Jarrett, rest in peace, Jerry Jarrett was there. And I think that was it. But we got to talking about Jimmy Hart. I mean, we got to talking about Kaufman. And some of the things that I assume were true weren't true. And I'll tell you why they weren't true, because I told Lawler, I said, whatever you guys do, do not tell me what you're going to do. I don't I want to look at it like a fan. And I never knew when they would go to the ring. I didn't know what they were going to do. <clears throat> so I, because I enjoyed it as just a fan. I really did. And the night that Lawler given the two pile drivers and they carted him out of the ring, I didn't know they were going to do that. I didn't know they were going to bring an ambulance and cart him out. I didn't know he was going to go to the hospital and, and be treated. And the reason I didn't know it was because Lawler didn't know it. <laughs> the only one that knew that he was going to lay there and sell that pile driver was Andy himself. And Lawler tells the story. They send word from one ref to another because he's just laying there in the middle of the ring and he won't get out. And they have, you know, every, every building has a curfew. You got to be out by a certain time. If you're not out by that time, they charge you overtime. And Memphis was, they didn't want to spend the money. And Lawler sent word said, tell that effing goof to get up and get out of the ring. And Calhoun, Jerry Calhoun, uh, he was a referee. He took it into the ring, and he said, Jerry said, get up. He said, tell him I'm not getting up. What? He said, I want an ambulance. Are you hurt? And he says, yes, or something. But he wasn't hurt, so they finally bring the ambulance. Oh, he said, tell him I'll pay for it. They didn't want to pay for an ambulance. He said, tell him I'll pay for it. And he said, well, hell, if he's going to pay for it, do it. And, he, <clears throat> and they brought him. They brought the ambulance, carved him out. And I never will forget this. I'm standing at the back of the, of the Mid-South Coliseum, and they have an upper tier. And when they brought him through on the, uh, on the gurney, people were throwing stuff down on him and trying to hit him and cussing him. He had heat out the, the yin-yang. And somebody says, did he really belong in a ring? I says, well, only one thing qualified uh, Andy Kaufman to be in a wrestling ring because he was five. Nine, five, eight, weighed 160 pounds, looked like hell, white pasty skin, greasy hair. He wore like white like long, long johns, johns, yeah. Long john and a Kmart pair of shorts and some shoes. And that's what he had. And the only thing that qualified Andy Kaufman to be in a main event in the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis is he sold 11,600 tickets. That's the only thing that qualified him to be in the ring. But when we was doing the dark side of the ring, I didn't even know that. So I sat o over there like the biggest mark ever. <laughs> <laughs> and I had them tell, tell me that, no, it wasn't planned. Because he would get so much heat in Memphis. He had heat. That's when he said, yeah, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Hey. <laughs> then he said, I'm from Hollywood. Oh, people hated him. And when you, and it was such an entertaining promo, you wanted to kill him. And when he would take women in the ring, and these were shoots. It really was. He would take women in the ring, 
And some of them were in pretty good shape. Some of them could wrestle a little bit, but they couldn't wrestle enough to really beat Andy because Andy would slide out. And the referee's not going to count Andy down anyway, so the deck was stacked. It was Bob Zamuda, wasn't it? He was the referee for these things, so he was never going to count Andy out. Well, Bob Zamuda may have been for not for all of them, though. They used they. I remember most of the time that we had Memphis referees in there. They're not. They're not going to count him down. But I do remember he had one match against Foxy. Mm-hmm. Remember the Foxy girl? Yeah. And her house had burned down about a month before, six weeks before. And Andy Kaufman paid, I don't know, it was $1,000 for any woman who could like, either go five minutes with him or to beat him. He would pay him $1,000. And she really needed the money because this was a shoot to her. And they had her, they'd had her on Memphis TV that Saturday before. So uh, I saw her on TV. I didn't meet her. I didn't meet her to the night of the match and she was getting ready to go out and she was standing outside the, and she was nervous as hell. And she's Dutch. And I said, Oh, hi Foxy. I never met her. I know who she was. And she said, you, you got any tips? And I started, I, I should have said, it's rigged. <laughs> Don't even go. <laughs> but she went out there and I, and I told her, well, this is a shoot with her. I told her, I said, whatever you do, get him early. Because I knew that if it went past two minutes, two and a half minutes, she would blow up. And blow up means she'd be sucking wind, especially with that big crowd out there. She was nervous. And she went out there and she took him down. The roof came off the Mid-South Coliseum. Hell, I jumped up. I'm a big fan. (laughs) Get him, Roxy. I mean, yeah, get him, get him, Foxy. And so... And then she took him down again. And then uh, I, I call it the ankle express. He would go outside that ring and he would strut around. And and then he then he, he would go out about three minutes gone. And then I saw it. It hit her. She was breathing hard. Oh, my. And then he took her down. Oh, uh, he abused her. It, it, it made you mad just watching him. You know, he just slapped her around a little bit, you know, playing with her. Oh, you wanted to kill him. And that was the night Lawler went in. And then Lawler said, hey, why don't you take on a man? And this had been going on. Oh, it was very, it's one of the best things I've ever seen at a wrestling match because they had the fans involved. They had the story. And it was something that Andy Kaufman made up in his head, I'm sure, years before. Because when Bill Apter called Lawler, he had called Vince Sr. And Vince Sr. says, well, I don't think, I don't know, he didn't sound like Vince Jr., but he was saying, ah, oh, well, that, that would make us too, like, fakey and stuff. I don't, I don't think I want to do that. If he had done that, they would have set records in New York and Boston and Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Baltimore, all their big cities. They would have set records. Because it was a story that Andy Kaufman just put in his head. And I think he did have matches. You mentioned matches. You know, he had some matches around the the horn, what we call a member of match with him and Jimmy Hart in Nashville. It was sold out. People just come to see Kaufman. They they wanted to see him. You know, there's footage of it as well. I sent you the links. Have you seen it? What's that? The match with him and with Jimmy Hart? Yeah, it goes a few minutes. It's hilarious. Yeah. They're, they're sort of doing like the same wrestling as he did with the women. It's just like really ridiculous. And then I think is it I Mount, was Man Mouth? I was, Tell I us was about there. It. That it was in Nashville, and the place was sold out. It was good, and Nashville was always a good town for crowd reaction. And sometimes you live off the crowd. Sometimes you could be tired and hear that crowd, and you know, you get that extra shot of adrenaline. But they had a they had a great match, and Andy Kaufman just, just he just had heat. So, but about this, I think he had one final match, and then it was announced that Andy Kaufman had gone to Mexico to be treated for it's called holistic medicine. I don't know what that is exactly. Home remedies, it I guess. Work. I don't, 
I mean, there's an old joke in, in the medical profession. What do you call alternative medicine that works? Medicine. Yeah. Yeah. So, and he died six months after this, this little run stopped. Yeah, it was a boxing match versus Jerry Lawler. In fact, this was somewhere around uh, November, in fact, 21st of November, 1983. I'd written it down. And then he died just six months later. I think one of his last appearances or maybe his last appearance was... Uh, this was at the point where Jerry Lawler was having his own the Jerry Lawler show talk show at the end of the TV, at yeah. the end of the regular studio wrestling, and there was, Andy was threatening to sue Lawler as he often did if his face was superimposed on on a turkey's body, I think. But he was coughing all the way through the interview, uh, and well, and that's when he said, "Jerry, I've got cancer," and Jerry was like, "No, you don't." You know what I mean? Just thought it was like a like a like a off color joke because he didn't even did smoke. He, did he tell him that? Yeah, he said uh, on air. No, that wasn't on air. That was after they did they did it, and he, and Andy said, "I'm very sorry about coughing through that. I've just been diagnosed with lung cancer." And then shortly afterwards, he disappears to Mexico and does a radiotherapy and all that kind of stuff. So, but I looked at Andy the first time I saw him, probably two years prior to his death. He looked like hell anyway. <laughs> he looked like pasty white, uh, pasty white, and he just didn't look good. But still, you know, he wasn't supposed to look good. So the people accepted that. And I mentioned to Lawler one time, I said, you know, and a fan had brought up that could Lawler, uh, had, did his power drivers have any effect on a Andy's cancer or his illness? Of course, he couldn't have. But but the time that really Lala was working with Andy, he had cancer. So, and and Lala didn't know it. Nobody knew it. And I don't know when Andy found out about it. I, I believe he had, a, like with lung cancer, it's quite advanced anyway, but then he had a persistent cough that I think he was ignoring for a while, as a lot of people do, and then he eventually goes to the doctor and finds out he's got it. I've got a couple more questions about Andy. Um, how many times... Did he make the trip to the territory? Was it 20, 30 times over the course of two years, more? No. Nah, you mean how many times did he work there? No, not how many times he worked, but, uh, you know, he how, how many times many he flew in? Uh, well, I would say that I remember six, eight times. I, but then some weeks he would go to Louisville. And then he would go to, and he would make the loop. Then he'd go back to where he went. Then you wouldn't see him again for like, and they do a bunch of interviews with him to put on the TV just to keep his, to keep his uh, image or his name fresh. But he didn't fly in all that many times because I think he appeared in. How many times did he appear in Memphis? You think ten times? Probably only. It's a great question. I, I don't know. I mean, when I was looking up his match listings, there was only 11 that I could find. I presume there are a few more if he's doing the loop and everything, you know, maybe a week's worth of matches. Yeah, he wasn't there all that much, but when he was there, he drew. Big time drew. And, of course, uh, toward the end, if he didn't have – see, he was – you couldn't make him a manager because now you're you're hurting not only him, but – I mean, you're hurting his drawing power. He had to be against Lawler, and that's the only only way that he was going to draw. And he has limited a limited number of appearances before he gets old hat. I'll uh, I'll tell you this. So the first time it was a uh, three on one handicap, I imagine against three women, 1981. Then Kaufman <laughs> versus Jerry Lawler in. Uh, Yes, April 5th, 1982. Then he does an appearance in May 1983. He does a loop of matches, some handicap against Jerry Lawler and a few against Jimmy Hart as well. And his last appearance or his last loop was uh, a couple of boxing matches, one handicap uh, in November of 1983. Do you know, I also want to bring this up, is that maybe Andy Kaufman is the only person who could turn, at that point, Jimmy Hart babyface. He did. In Nashville, that night I was there, Hart was a big baby face. They hated Kaufman. Of course, one of the reasons they said, well, I'm um, uh, uh, from Nashville, Tennessee. He would do that interview, and everybody would – they 
I even had one of the guys, we had one of the guys in Memphis, Dream Machine, who was really from Memphis, and he heard the interview about uh, Jimmy doing well off of Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> he got mad. He come up to me, he said, he shouldn't be allowed to do that interview <laughs> like that. I said, Dream, he was, he's working. Oh, I don't think he is. <laughs> I said, well, he's getting heat with it. But but some of the guys actually, get, when you make the guys mad, you know you made the fans mad. With Andy, I think you've already said this before, but, you know, entirely the opposite on camera than he was off. Very quiet. Uh, used to, what, did he used to meditate before matches or appearances or something? Do you remember that? He was, he, I didn't know if he meditated or not. I was, you know... I didn't like in Louisville, he could have went off and meditated because they had all those different rooms in Memphis. He could have done it. Probably Evansville too. In Nashville, he couldn't have done it because we only had one room. So where would he have meditated on the stool? He could have went in there and, <laughs> and done it, but, but he was quiet anyway. And he was not funny. He wasn't funny. I mean, we're much funnier on this show than he ever was. He had a routine and he'd go out there and, he, he was going to read a book one time. What was that book he was going to read? Was it The Great Gatsby? <laughs> he was going to read it. I remember one time he was in this comedy club. I read this. I, I wasn't there. But he took all the people from the club down to the Crystal, you know, the, and he bought them all hamburgers, everybody in the club. And see, Andy thought wrestling was the greatest thing in the world because he was used to work in these little comedy clubs that might have a 200 person capacity, 150, maybe 100. And all of a sudden, he's in front of 11,600 people in Memphis, Mid South. Oh, he loved that. What, what a change from working the small club to working the big arena. Mm -hmm. So, and he loved to be the center of attention. And I called him a comedian one time. No, he said, I'm not a comedian. I'm a sketch artist. And I had to go, of course, look that up. I didn't know what that meant. But, yeah, he, 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 got, a, he got a response from people because he got a lot of hecklers because he wasn't funny. I don't know, really. I'm glad Taxi picked him up because as a <laughs> comedy career, he didn't have one. He really didn't. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, he was, if, if he could stay in character he was memorable thank you thank you very much yeah great so uh due to time constraints i was going to give you a list of celebrity in fact you know i will do briefly uh, here is my list i'll probably make my own little video at some point of celebrity wwe Hall of Fame inductees that would actually make sense so you get rid of your kid rocks and you get rid of your drew carries Here's my list. Lawrence Taylor, because he headlined a WrestleMania. Yeah. Uh, Mr. T, uh, because he also headlined yep. a WrestleMania. He did a lot. Uh, controversial, but I think is correct, is Donald Trump, uh, because he... Wait a minute. Isn't Donald Trump in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's already in. No, I'm just saying this is my ideal list of celebrities. Oh, okay. Whether they're in okay. or not, Mr. T's in as well. Uh, but Lawrence Taylor isn't. Cindy Lauper, because she did contribute a lot. Uh, and she's not yep. in. Mike Tyson, who is in. Yep. Muhammad Ali, who isn't in, which I find incredible. Um, Floyd Mayweather Jr., because he basically was the main event of that WrestleMania where he fought Big Show. Uh, Andy Kaufman, who's going in. Here's a controversial one. Arnold Schwarzenegger, even though he was never a wrestler, he's inspired everybody who ever came after him to lift weights and look the way they do now. And the last one would be Dennis Rodman. He never really appeared for WWE, but he drew a couple of huge houses for WCW and was, you know, they were, he was a big deal for them. Who do you think, celebrity-wise, actually deserves it? Out of that bunch? Uh, it could be anyone yeah. that I've not mentioned or have mentioned. Well, since this is, a, I think they all belong in. I really do. We brought Dennis Rodman to TNA one time. <laughs> I'm in creative. And they said, well, we can bring him, but he can't touch anybody. I said, what? Yeah, he just, 
we can see him and that's it. I says, well, why are we bringing him then? Why don't we just show a picture of him? We're going to do that. Why don't we save $5,000? Why bring him? <laughs> so we brought him in and I have a picture of me and Dennis Rodman and Dusty and Jimmy Hart. It's a great picture. So nobody ever seen that. You want to see it? Yeah. Mr. Well, I don't have it here right now. I'll send it to you. Okay. But that, and I'm looking at my picture the other day and I said, I mean, this is a, this is a good picture. Dusty's in, Jimmy Hart's in, Robin's in. I mean, he should be in. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll be in. Is a celebrity or? No, just, just in. <laughs> Dusty's not in as a celebrity. I no, mean, no. just in, in there, just for the hell of it. Yeah. So. Uh, any other celebrities that you think deserve to be in that I've not met? I've got a list of other people uh, I can read if, if so. Uh, I can't think of any right off the top of my head. That's fine. We'll leave it. Uh, next one is... You know, I was going to ask about Batista, but we'll leave that for another day because, or unless we've got Batista, Batista, yeah, indeed, we'll leave him for another day. I was going to Blue ask a question Tista. about that. Blue Batista, <laughs> that was pretty creative, I thought. Really? Should we? I mean, we can talk about Batista if you like, but I mean, we do have uh, the the main event, as it were, to discuss. Well, let's talk about the main event. Okay, then <clears throat> the last of four inductees, the Great Muta. Now, uh, why the great Muta? It's not the in, it's not the inductee. It, is that right? The inductee. Anyway, whatever. It's not the great Muta we're going to be talking about. It is going to be the person who is going to be inducting him, Rick Flair. So, oh, my friend, your good friend Rick Flair. Now, some people might be confused why we're bringing this up now because there was a sort of uh, a back and forth. This all started when. We posted a video a few weeks ago when I was away and then I didn't have Wi-Fi for a few days and I looked at my phone and went, that video's done suspiciously well. <laughs> that seems to be really, really uh, well engaged with the audience. Anyway, Ric Flair saw it, old thin-skinned Ric Flair, made a big complaint about uh, on Twitter. Uh, in fact, I've got the quotes. Uh, this on March 11th. Thank God they used the word veteran and didn't call you a legend, you being Dutch. Just a miserable old wrestler trying to make a book. Uh, the uh, blackest of kettles calling the uh, pot black there. Uh, <laughs> or pot or kettle, whichever way it goes. Uh, by the way, you never had a legacy to begin with. Woo. Uh, and then a second one. I just made you more famous than you'll ever be from a single tweet. Woo. Uh, I mean, he didn't even know how to make someone famous in a tweet. For starters, you tag the person in it. Or, you know, at least put their name in. Um, so... I'm sure we all read the miserable old wrestler trying to make a book thing, had a good laugh about it as of the uh, deep irony. And then you wrote something. Let me have a look here. It's uh, an enormous portion of Ric Flair's own fans were saying things to him on his Twitter, like, you know, put down the bottle, call the nurse to put you to bed, take away the phone for another day and calm down. And everyone who watched our video, who are Dutch Mantel fans, everyone's basically in agreement uh, with you. So, a day later, Dutch, this is a Rick tweeting again, Dutch, let's just agree to hopefully uh, growing old, reluctantly but gracefully, we as old veterans need to be united, not at odds. You responded same, uh, same day, earlier tonight, Rick Flair, Nature Boy, sent out a tweet calling for a succession of words between us. I agree, Mr. Flair, tons of respect for you, didn't intend to ruffle your feathers, love to have you on my podcast to get your side, take care, sir. Now, that seems like everything's sort of, you know, uh, water under the bridge now. And then it wasn't. On March 13th, you walk it back and double down in a Facebook <laughs> post on Flair's last match and Flair insulting the fans who paid to see the match. Now, you, there's a couple more quotes I can go for, but what happened between that tweet where you sort of back to uh, neutral again to you being unhappy with Flair? Well, first of all, I would have never said anything at all. It wouldn't even got my attention, really. But he said, hey, you're just a miserable old... Uh, Ex wrestler or something trying to make a buck, and that is the blackest of kettles calling another kettle blacker. Now, and I don't know why he singled me out because Dave Meltzer, Dave Meltzer, and all I, I was saying was how bad the match was. It was bad, it was terrible. You got a guy who can't go, and I don't know. And I heard that Flair put this match together because they had an agent for it. And I heard it was Road Dog, but Road Dog wouldn't let this go. 
because Flair had it in his head and he wanted to do this match this way. And by God, they were going to do it that way, which in retrospect, like that word retrospect was a terrible mistake because I've had people tell me they thought he died in the match because he was having his heart was pumping faster than slower. And he was about to pass out. I, I think by his own admission, he passed out twice in the match, but it was terrible, but he didn't say anything to Meltzer or anything to love like the other hundred podcasters or wrestling journalists who critiqued the match. He said something to me, but a personal attack. So I'm not going to let that go. So yeah. And I hit, hit kind of irked me a little bit. Didn't piss me off because I know wrestlers, but and Dave Meltzer said it was. I, I see blood in the water. Well, yeah, people want to hear more about this story. So yeah, it, it presented itself. So I went after him, and then when he put up, yeah, let's let it go. Let's now he's calling himself a veteran. Let's be like old veterans, and then let let's have peace between us. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I agree. Love you to have you on the podcast and all that. But then I heard privately he's still blasting me. So I, I let him have it on my Facebook post because there I have room. I can ex explain all my, my critique of him and what he's been charged with that I've never been charged with. You know, you know, the sex harassment deal and the, the paying the taxes and the borrowing the money. And, and I just I just laid into him. And then all the other fans laid into him. Now, when you're saying that he put his 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 Twitter post up and every word is capitalized, uh, the first letter in it, that's not him. That's his social media manager. Because I don't think Rick could even do that. I really don't. I don't think he's figured out, and I haven't figured it out that well myself, but I know Rick Flair hadn't figured out how to tweet, I don't think. But, and I wrote him, a, a long Facebook critique of not only him, but his social media manager too. And I said, you know, if you're going to come to, if you're going to, that old saying, don't bring a, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. And I just ripped him up and the fan ripped him up too. And then all of a sudden it just all disappeared. It just floated off into the, into the ether. And I'm glad because, you know, but, but Ric Flair, He's gonna he's gonna induct the great Muda. Is that who it? Yeah. So I don't know. I I never thought I would see Ric Flair back in the WWF anyway, because he was supposed to go. This is two years ago, I think. He was supposed to go to AEW. Then all that plane ride from hell stuff came out on uh, Tales from the Territories, Dark Tales from the Territories. And it stopped that because it, oh, it, it makes it, it pits him in such a bad, bad light. And what pissed me off really more than him attacking me was him attacking fans, calling them MFN idiots. Now, listen. These people spent money to see his last match. Thank God it's his last match. <laughs> so far. And then he 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 bad mouths them. But without the fans, he would have been nothing. So he owes them everything. He owes me nothing. He can talk to me. But to talk to his own fans that way. And that shows you how much he respects his own fans. Now he he can't. He didn't even ever take that back either. He didn't say he's sorry. He didn't apologize. He didn't do nothing. He's he's still Ric Flair. And I mean, I, I would have if if my fans, all seven of them, <laughs> but I would never talk to them in in such a way, and I would never disrespect them like that. Because when you're asking somebody to pay money to see you, and then not only do you not perform, do you not live up to what they had anticipated, 
but then you cuss them out and call them pieces of crap. That's not right. And I attacked him on that. So, but the fans, they, they got with it. They ripped him. They ripped him a, a, a new one. You know, the old joke was, hey, did you see Rick Flair's last match? Did you see Rick Flair's last match? I said, oh, God, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I put that joke in. That's an old, that's an old, that's an old Russell joke that you tell somebody. <clears throat> he's uh, he's obviously not le- well. I mean, maybe maybe his tweeting. I've never seen anyone else tweet and capitalize every single word as uh, as somebody who's written a book as you have. That's unbelievably annoying. But anyway, that, I mean, that's the least of it. He's obviously learned to Google because he seems to be now Googling his own name every day just to see who's criticizing him this week. And, you know, an interview I did a couple of months ago with Shane Douglas, somehow that got into his ear, but he doesn't even seem to watch the videos. He maybe, like, sees, like, a brief write-up and a couple of quotes on a wrestling news website. He's not actually watching the videos because on that video, Shane Douglas, for the most part, was actually very nice about him. Um, And then maybe he's got the wrong end of the stick or, you know, thought it was more of an attack than it was on the video beforehand. But uh, I want to go back to this. So, like, obviously one day you're all uh, buddy-buddy, well, not buddy-buddy, but you know what I mean, on on Twitter, and then the next day you're on Facebook again. So is this some mutual friend who said, hey, Rick still, no names, obviously, but some mutual friend who's getting in touch with you and saying, listen, he's really upset with you over saying this and he's still saying this, that, and the other. Who got in charge with me? Who, who got in touch with me? Yeah, I'm saying oh. no names, don't give it away. But, I mean, people were getting in touch, a mutual friend, I'm presuming. Well, it, it's the wrestler hotline, you know. And I'm sure he was. It's something that said, well, he, he may have done that there, but he hadn't forgot you. That's all you got to say. So mm-hmm. then, I, then I ripped into him again. Hey, I never said I'll make peace. What he wanted to do, he wanted to make peace on his terms. Well, that's not how it works. You know, might have been, I actually kind of apologized to him. I said, I didn't mean to ruffle your feathers, which is a kind of apology, but not yet. But he never even came close to that. But see, Ric Flair thinks there's no, the guy has issues. The guy has a lot of issues. That will never be that will never be uh, faced because he's gone too long. Everybody thought he was dead like three years ago. And if I looked in the paper or I read something on a wrestling website, Ric Flair dead at seventy three or whatever, that would not surprise me. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to see that. But I don't think it would surprise anyone. Because I still think he's he, he still thinks he's like 35. Because this is what happens when you get older. Your body gets older, but your brain doesn't. My brain still thinks like I'm 35 or 30 or 25, but my body doesn't. So and I think that's that's the issue with, with Rick right there. Mm. Because he he's he's still the Limousine riding, high flying, kiss stealing, wheeling dealing, whatever he is. And he never got out of that phase. And he's the type who, you know, they say don't believe your own publicity. He is the type who not only believed his own publicity, he thought it was God honest truth. But I've heard stories about Rick, like if anybody else, like if the people in charge of creatives, they wanted to kind of get behind somebody else. Well, he would actively work against them to keep them from getting, and I don't have firsthand evidence, but, but I've heard this for years, that he, he, he would do that. So, but he is what he is. You either accept him or you don't accept him because he's not going to change. Yeah. Uh, I should also point out, how old do you think his liver age is? Oh, my God. You know, telling how how that is probably 130. <laughs> tell you the truth, right? Uh, one more thing I'll bring up is uh, of all the people who came to your sort of defence, Carrie Silkin, former Ring of Honor owner, uh, once again reiterated the fact that Flair really screwed him over by stealing 
uh, that Kerry yep. paid him up front for unfulfilled Ring of Honor appearances. Kerry then said that he was going to go sue him, went to a lawyer and basically said, there's already 100 people trying to get money out of Rick and you're going to be like the 101st in line, so I wouldn't even bother. Well, I called Kerry, or Kerry called me, I forgot. And I asked him, and he he readily admits, he says, don't blame Rick. He says, blame me. He said, I'm the idiot. And I don't mean to use the term idiot, but he said, I'm the guy who gave him the money. And he said, what it was supposed to be, I gave him the money to make uh, future appearances in Ring of Honor that he just never acknowledged and, and never intended to appear on. And he said, I didn't get it on paper. And I said, well, that idiot, <laughs> <laughs> that idiot tag might work, but he just took the money. And I don't know where the, he said he gave him $10,000 in appearance that he never fulfilled. And he never even heard from him. Like he would call him, he would never answer. He would send him emails, never answer, you know, lawyers. He, he just wouldn't answer it like it didn't exist. And there is another uh, WCW guy that helped him with his wedding. And they rented a, a venue for it. And I think he owes him like 20000 And when it come time to pay up, he turned to Rick and Rick said, I, well, I got to give it to you later. So the guy paid the $20,000. And then he couldn't find Rick either. You know, Rick, when you don't want him, he's all over the place. <laughs> like if you say, if you want to find Rick Flair, bad mouth him, then he'll, he'll come out. But otherwise, he, he, he just, if, if, if he owes you money, not going to do it. That's not even talking about the, the IRS problems he had, and he's had those for years. He borrowed money from Jim Crockett, borrowed money from Vince McMahon, and big, big money from Vince McMahon. And Vince says, don't even think about paying me back. Well, hell, I wish I could find a guy like that. So, but anyway... <sighs> Well, uh, but that's that's Vince, that's that's uh, Rick Flair in a nutshell. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna half quote Rick here on. I believe he said this on his own podcast, but I don't have it written down, so I'll probably butcher the quote. He said that he's only got three real friends in his life: Vince McMahon, Hulk Hogan, and Comrade Thompson, and that's because they will lend him money and and uh, ask no questions. No kidding. Hulk, Hulk, I need one of those friends. Yeah. Now, Hulk. <laughs> I don't know. You might have to put a little waiver in there because I don't know if Hulk would loan him. Of course, I don't know that if that's who his real friends are. I wonder, do they consider him a real friend? Conrad's his father-in-law. Well, the other way around. Son-in-law. So, Conrad is Ric Flair's father-in-law. Right? Son in no, no, no. Ric Flair is Conrad's son-in-law. No, I've got it wrong. Forget it. He's someone's someone's son-in-law and someone's father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so he's related by marriage to conrad so if you take three hundred thousand dollars that he said he got well he could have got it but under normal circumstances i don't think he would get that much money and i still really don't believe it because i think the total house was only 400 something maybe and of course they had maybe pay-per-view pay as well they had a paper i don't think but i still don't think he's gonna give him four three hundred thousand dollars out of the pay-per-view pay-per-view thread the chain i just mm. well let's say i'm i'm doubtful of that okay uh right so before we shut down the podcast and it is a very long podcast already uh you wanted to make mention of bray wyatt now i've not written this down or anything but we know that bray's been disappeared for quite a few weeks there was originally a theory that he'd gone home because he was upset with creative lots of people were texting in news websites for that and then uh a, a it, more likely is that Bray is very, very unwell, and we're not even sure he's going to be at WrestleMania. But you want to talk about Bray, so uh, Bray Wyatt. Okay, they said he's unwell. What does that mean? Sick? Yep. Sick with what? Heartache? I, I, no idea. Did, uh, it's one of those 
things that no one actually knows why he's just disappeared from. I think the last time he appeared on TV was in a, a backstage. He was on the Titan Tron, and he was making fun of Muscle Man Bobby Lashley, and then he's just disappeared well, for a month. Well, Brock Lesnar turned down a match with with Bray Wyatt, mm-hmm. and I think I've covered the reasons why. Because with Brock, whether he won, he would lose. Whether he beat him, he would still lose. Because Bray is kind of like a a, a joke now. Because the, the 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 deal is, I read that Bray Wyatt's writer in WWE was let go. So I think with the writer being let go, they finally may have realized that this Bray stuff that he's conjured up in his head doesn't work on a on a big scale. Because I watched his, the last time he was on TV, I watched it, but I watched it like, what's the point to this? And then they just stopped it. Then they went to commercial. They'd have been better off going to commercial before they went to Bray and and, and dropped that. This is what I think they're going to do. They're going to do with Bray. I think they're going to take him back. They're going to repackage him and bring him back out. Now, whether that's true or not, we'll wait and see. But I think this would be a great time to do it. That's why he's not on not on WrestleMania. And they're going to wait, I think, a month, or maybe two months after WrestleMania and bring him back in a repackage. Now, if he's sick, I don't know what could be wrong with him, really, because he didn't get injured wrestling. And I don't know. So that's that's a mystery to me. But, hey. That's why we watch wrestling, right? Mm-hmm. Who's right and who's wrong? Do you still get if you've got a down? Well, if you've got like a fixed contract like you had, did you all you did get payoffs on top of it, didn't you, for WrestleMania appearances and pay per view appearances? Yeah, I mean, when I was there, you had what to call the downside, mm-hmm. and then when you made the and when you made your appearances, yeah, you know, it was added on to the to the downside. So you would, it would get to a point to where they, they owed me anyway. And then on top of that, they would, what, whatever else they owed me. Now, a lot of times, a lot of guys, they don't do that as they go. They wait to the end of the year. And some guys have actually owed them money <laughs> at, at the end of the year. Cause they, they never met their downside. But on the downside, too, and this is, I don't think a lot of people realize this when you say, well, what, what was he making there? They say, I was making 250 What a lot of people don't realize is he may have made 250 just out of merchandising. Because, and during WrestleMania week, they send you every place they can send you where you sign stuff. I mean, they make their money off you. And I mean, they, if you, it's a picture. The picture is like, let me sell it for fifty bucks or forty bucks. But it's just a picture that costs eighty five cents, and you sign it. So what they're paying for is the the, the signed picture. That's what they're paying for, and they'll charge like I don't know forty fifty bucks for it. Mm-hmm. And you magnify that by a hundred guys, a hundred talents or more, they make a lot of money. You should big time. Because that's the purpose. That's the purpose of it is to make money. There's a there's a there's a website that's still out. I actually checked it out recently. WWE Auction. It's their own version of like eBay. And one of the things they were selling was signed baseballs by Kevin Owens. It's like, what uh-huh. relation does that have to do with anything? But people were still bidding for him. You know, fifty dollars a baseball or more. Well, what they do, a lot of baseball fans go and they bring baseballs. And I've signed baseballs. They just want you to sign it. Now, a, a lot of attention has been uh, laid out on the table about WWE talent arriving at an airport and like 100 fans are waiting on them mm-hmm. in baggage claims, sign this, sign this, sign this. That was Rhea this. Ripley, in fact, who mentioned that recently. And well, said- it, it happened. And, and Rey Mysterio. It, and I've seen that, but they do it to everybody. 
But most of these people who have time to go and hang around the, the baggage claim area to wait for wrestlers, they're pros. Hmm. They're taking that same merchandise and they're reselling it, which is really, which makes them their fans, but they're pro fans. They take that same material uh, or items that you have signed and they put them up for rebid on eBay or on wherever they want to do it. And some of them are very, very aggressive. And now WWE is taking is taking a little more of a hand in that because they can't really put a guy there, a security guard there uh, to get everybody away. They just can't. They, they, it's too many people. So they leave it up to the talent to to kind of forage for themselves. And some of those situations get a little bit hairy, a little bit testy. So, and I, I've actually run into him before. I say, Hey, I got to go, got to go. No, sign this and sign this and sign that. I don't have time. And then they keep on and on. And finally, you just lose your temper a little bit. Mm. And then, of course, they're going to get that on video. Uh, they just get the last part of it like, Get out of here, you GD, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. that's all they should. Now, all of a sudden, you, you're just ungrateful. <laughs> So the, the best way is just, you know, I don't have time and just keep going. Sean Morley, gotta... Sean Morley, Val Venus once told me that he was in a hotel lobby trying to sign in because they come into the hotel lobbies as well and these pro fans know. One guy, like some greasy, big, fat, greasy guy, turns up with him and says, hey, can you just sign these, brother? And he like, hands him like 200 photos of Val. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm just going to stand here and sign 250 photos of myself just so he can sell them, you know, at a... It's a two thousand percent markup. No kidding. I mean, I don't think they really mind signing one or two for uh, two hundred. The guy he he took a chance and just getting cussed out. I mean, you can't hit them. You can't do this. Hell, some of these guys you hit, you might get your ass whipped <laughs> trying, <laughs> trying to get them back up. But anyway, yeah, that that is a that is a situation that the fans need to. They need to back off a little bit sometimes. Yeah, uh, let me just give you the quote very quickly. People, this is Rhea Ripley underscore WWE on Twitter. People need to respect that no means no. At airports do not follow me outside. Today has put me off completely. I will not sign anything that isn't a personal photo of us anymore. Hate me, I don't care. Disagree with me. Try putting yourselves in our shoes for one bloody day. See, it's easier for the heels. Because the hills could say, "Get, I wouldn't sign this if you were the last son of a on earth." So you can do that. The baby faces have the hard time because now say, they're saying no, and you're not supposed to say no. But I don't know the. Uh, that's a hard position they put the wrestlers in, and uh, and Rhea Ripley, I, I sympathize with her, and Ray Mysterio, and but but they they will do that, especially a. Uh, if Roman Reigns signed something, you imagine that that would be like the the, the holy grail, I guess, mm -hmm. of, of merchandise. If you have yeah. or Undertaker, autograph. I mean, he's he's charging two hundred and something dollars just to sign something, so he knows how valuable yeah. that is. Yeah, if he's signing that much, if he's getting that much for one autograph, you can't expect him to sign things for free at an airport. He's undermining his own business. Yeah. Limited you know edition. I mean? Limited edition makes it worth more. Well, but that situation hit a hit a correct itself over time. Yeah, it'll get better. It won't go away, but it'll get better. Absolutely. Listen, we have talked. Probably this may well be the longest podcast we've ever done. So uh, I will shut it down now. We've both got books. You're probably sick of me hearing and talking about it now. We've got a T-shirt out that I'm not wearing because I've lost it somewhere in my house. Uh, there's a mug that it's not for sale. Uh, this the give us five stars on iTunes if you love that outro. You've got to give us five stars, and uh, if you don't give us five stars for that outro, give us five stars for Dutch's hat. There it is. Look at that. Yeah. Yes. S seriously, a zoot suit and a violin case. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it might work. I could go. Uh, you know, I used to live in Nashville. You go down the street in Nashville, and they call it. I didn't know they called it busking. I think it's called yes. busking. Yes. Yeah. And they just go and they just they, they play for tips. So, and you hear some of the greatest musicians in the world 
just on the street in Nashville. You go into any bar down on Second Avenue, and I knew one guy. I didn't know him, but I he, he knew who I was. But he said he would play six bars a night. He would go on there, and he would play a set. Then he'd go down the street. He'd play another set. And he quit about 3 o'clock in the morning. But he said by the time it was over, he would be in five, six, maybe seven bars and, and play on a set, and people would tip him, and he'd go. Mm. And he did this seven nights a week. And he said, the days I don't go, nobody misses me, but he'd go the next night, and he's playing. And, but you're playing there. If the people enjoy it, they tip you. If they don't, they're not going to tip you. So easy way to know if people like you or not. Yeah. and uh, you, what, if wrestlers, what if wrestlers got tips? They did, didn't hey. they, at one point? In, or, like, they paid the fines. I heard that in Germany. Like, uh, if the good guy was caught fouling the bad guy, the fans would throw money to, to pay their fines. But then, obviously, they'd split the money. You mean it was a little bit shady? Some might say it was a bit of a work. <laughs> Some might say. <laughs> lady, I'm doing the Gutfeld thing, aren't I? Put your tip jar there in the corner, you know, or let it be circling around and people start tipping. Hmm. Hey, not a bad idea. Listen, I'm, uh, I'm going to go now, so I'm going to shut this podcast down. So thank you very much uh, for watching. We will be back early next week because we're going to be doing a WrestleMania review. So I'll try and get that out on Monday if possible. If not, it'll be Tuesday. But for me, thank you very much for watching. For Van Morrison over there in Tampa <laughs> as well, thank you very much. And Dutch, we the people. We the people. See you next week.